There's a lot we don't know about mental health, but one thing we know for sure is that most serious mental illness, and by serious mental illness, I'm talking about illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression. These illnesses typically begin in adolescence and early adulthood. So what does that mean for our youth? Well, it's bad enough getting sick. It's bad enough getting sick with a serious mental illness, but this is a terrible time for young people. This is the time when they're right in the middle of their education, be it high school, university, college training. Maybe they're uh, starting their first job. It's also a time where they develop relationships, sometimes have their first intimate relationship. And generally, they're supposed to be having a good time. And often if they get sick for several years, it's very difficult for them to go back and capture what they've lost out on in their development. And sometimes it's even impossible. So what can we do about this? So as a clinical researcher, we have three aims. The first is early identification. The second is prevention. And the third is early treatment. So let's start with early identification. So what would be great would be if we could identify people on the day one when they get sick. Now, that, in mental illness, that typically doesn't happen. Often people are ill for several months or even years before they actually get the care that they deserve. What would be even better would be if we could identify people who are going to develop a serious mental illness before that serious mental illness even begins. So how could we do that? So this would mean thinking about risk factors, trying to work out who are the people that are at risk for the later development of a serious mental illness. So that's pretty hard to do. So how do, how do we know those kind of things? So what we've done is we've developed a framework to try and understand who may be at more or less risk of developing an illness. So at the top of this, um, triangle that there are the, the people with a serious mental illness. But if we look at the bottom, this group healthy but have a family history, this is the group with the least risk. They do have some risk. And so we know for many illnesses, if it runs in the families, an individual may have a greater risk. So if you have a mum or, or a dad with um, asthma, you have a 15% chance of developing asthma. If you have a mum or dad with schizophrenia, you have a 5% chance of developing schizophrenia. So these young people are at a small degree of risk because they have a first degree relative with a serious mental illness. They themselves are doing well, they're healthy, they're doing well in school and really don't have any issues. Then we move to the next group. This is the group who are distressed. So they have some beginning symptoms. They may complain, and in a healthy way, they may complain about mild symptoms of anxiety or depression. They don't have serious symptoms. They certainly don't meet any criteria for a mental illness, but they are distressed and they are stressed. Now, you might say, well, doesn't this happen to most people? Aren't there times in our lives where, you know, things aren't going that well and we feel a bit anxious or we feel a bit, you know, distressed? Maybe some of these young kids, they're moving to a new school or their parents are getting divorced. These are normal things. And yes, you're right. And, you know, we even talk about adolescent angst um, and we do see these things. But within this group, there are young people who are maybe just having a hard time. But there are also young people who are beginning the trajectory towards a serious mental illness. This is the very first stage where they're presenting with very mild, low-level symptoms. And then we move to the next group, those with sub-threshold symptoms of a serious mental illness. And this is the group most at risk. So again, this group of young people, they don't have a, di a diagnosis. They don't meet any criteria for a serious illness, but they are symptomatic. So a good example might be young guy, um, in, grade 12, in grade 11, he was doing very well in school. He played on school teams, had great marks, lots of friends, but his mum has schizophrenia. And then suddenly in grade 12, he's not going to school as much. His marks are falling. He isn't really doing much with his friends. In fact, his friends have stopped calling him because he just doesn't go out with them anymore. 
and in fact he's spending most of his time in his room or in the basement. This is a young person that you really would be worried about because with a family history and already showing signs of a, a decline in functioning. We could take schizophrenia as a good example. So people with schizophrenia typically have hallucinations or delusions. So for hallucinations, they might be hearing voices. The voices might be saying things about them, bad things about them, good things about them. The voices might be telling them to do things. And sometimes people with schizophrenia even act on what these voices have told them to do. They might have delusions. They may feel that, you know, they're a famous person or that they've come from space or that, you know, the FBI are after them. They become very paranoid. They may feel that, you know, their neighbors are spying on them. Or they go home and, and they feel that somebody's been in their home and, and moved their things around. So these are sort of typical examples of the kind of thinking that somebody with schizophrenia might have. And what's important is these people are, they believe this. Um, it, I mean, that's the definition of a delusion. That it's a fixed belief that you really can't shift. So these young people that are at high risk, they have similar kind of symptoms, but not quite the same. So they don't hear voices, but they might hear somebody calling their name. Now that happens to you know, a lot of us a lot of the time, but for them it's happening on a daily basis. They keep thinking, they hear somebody, in fact they hear it so often they don't even check anymore. They might start to feel things are not quite the same or things look a little bit different in their street, or the houses look strange. Um, and one example, a young guy, he's on the sea train, and maybe he's going to see his doctor. So he's on the sea train, and he's sitting there, and he starts to think, you know, somehow these people around me, they know things about me. And I don't know how they know things about me, and they've got some information about me. Um, but it's a bit worrying. And then he might see a couple of them whisper to each other. So then he gets a bit worried and thinks, okay, maybe when I get off the train, they'll be there or they might say something to me or they might even, you know, be aggressive towards me. He gets to his stop, he gets off, and he gets off the train, nobody else gets off with him. And then he starts to think, wait a minute, that's kind of crazy. These things don't happen. Um, well, these people don't know information about me. He might be going to his doctor's office and he'll say the same thing to his doctor. You know, when I was on the train, this is what happened. But I know it's not true. I know these things don't happen. And this is what these young people who are at this sub-threshold level are like. They have these beginning symptoms, but they know they're not real. But they're troubled by them because they know these things shouldn't be happening to them. So what's the next stage that we think about? Well, it would be prevention. And this is very much the core of our research. We want to know who are the people that are going to develop a serious mental illness? Like, why does it happen to them? And how does it happen? How do mental illnesses begin? Um, you know, what, what's the cause? So what do we do? So the first thing we do we see what happens. So I have large samples of young people that I work with, and so we follow them. We follow them for over a year, sometimes for two years, sometimes up to four years. And we want to follow them to see what, what happens, what course do these symptoms take? Do they get better? Do they get worse? Do they actually develop a serious illness? And, and we find that some people do get better. Some people stay the same. Some people get worse. And some people do go on to develop one of those serious mental illnesses. So then what's the next thing we need to do? So we want to discover the differences. So I've talked a little bit about symptoms like anxiety, depression, but we study a lot more things than just, just those symptoms. We, we look at people's functioning. We look to see how they function with their friends, how they function in school or at work. We, um, we test their cognitive functioning. We look at their history. Uh, have they experienced trauma in the past? Are, have they been bullied? Are they being bullied? Do they use cannabis? Do they use other drugs? Where did they grow up? Um, are they immigrants? Have they come from a war-torn country? So we really want to get a good picture of, of you know, everything we can about these young people 
because what we want to do is we want to look at the differences between the people that don't get sick and the people that do get sick. And these differences would be our predictors. And our predictors are the things that are going to help us predict who will go on to develop a more serious illness. All of these things are things that we hear or we see, um, you know, like symptoms or hearing people's history. But there's other things that we can look at to try and help predict who might develop an illness and how that illness might begin. And these are called biological markers. So these are the biomarkers. So these are things that we can't necessarily see. Uh, and so to do that, we, we study people's blood. We draw blood samples. And a different kind of scientist from myself, they will, they will examine the blood and look at different things. We do brain scans, so through imaging. We look to see, look for differences in the brain. Is it in the white matter, the gray matter? Is it a change in, in the gray matter over time? Or is it how the brain might work? So these are the things that, that we do in our research. Now, discovery is exciting and, and you know, all of our research we find very exciting. But what do we do in the meantime? Because here we are, we're talking about you know, large groups, and there are a lot of them, young people who have these very early signs and symptoms of possible mental illness. So the next thing would be early treatment. Early treatment can be, go two ways. So we can study treatments, and, and we are doing that. So, you know, we hypothesize what kind of treatments might help these young people, what kind of treatments might actually sort of interfere and stop the progression from these early signs to a more serious mental illness. And, and that's very much part of our ongoing research. But the other side is, you know, these young people are not doing that well. You know, they have symptoms, they're not functioning well, um, but yet they're not sick. And so it's very hard for them to get treatment in a, you know, in a psychiatric um, hospital or department. And so we need to do something for them at the same time as we're conducting our research. So if you go back to the triangle, if you remember, the very top was the people with a serious mental illness, and there are plenty of established, you know, well-established treatments for people that do have an illness. But what about these people that are just at risk? So the bottom group, the people at the least risk who have a, a family history, we can offer them some education. And, and this is very typical of, of um, illnesses that, you know, do have a, a, a family history. So, for example, if, if you have heart disease in your family, then, you know, the education you get is that, you know, you need to lose weight, you need to exercise, you ought not to be eating those foods that clog up your arteries. And so, similarly, we can give these young people education. If you have a family history, then you really need to monitor your stress. You don't want to be getting stressed. You may not, you know, you may not want to be using drugs, particularly cannabis and, and amphetamines, and stay away from those kind of things. Next level, the people who have the distress and, and sort of very early symptoms, they, we can offer them some sort of coping strategies and support. So it may be that they're having a difficult time with some things going on in their life. So if we can actually offer them some coping strategies, that might help them with their current symptoms. If you can help current symptoms, then you're reducing the likelihood that the symptoms will evolve into more serious symptoms. And then for the, the group that are at most risk, who are already looking as if they, you know, they look very much like the people who have a serious illness, we have a lot of different treatments that we offer. We can work with them in their families. We can work with them in groups. We can help them with their functioning, with social skills. We can offer uh, cognitive behavior therapy to help them with their symptoms and their thinking. Um, and sometimes we even have to offer them medications. So our focus on youth mental health is to identify those at risk and intervene as soon and as well as possible. Thank you.